you know, we went through and we looked at what the causes of scrams were in the U.S. reactor fleet over several years. And about two thirds of them were due to things that we don't have in our system. The gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. Chris Colbert, uh, welcome to our show, Titans of Nuclear. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're the CSO of uh, New Scale Power. Can you tell me first what actually CSO is? There, there are plenty of abbreviations in many positions uh, in a nuclear company. There's a CEO, there's C a CSO, there's CTO. Uh, what are you actually doing on everyday basis? So uh, CSO is the chief strategy officer. I've held that position with New Scale since 2014. And basically what I do is a combination of business development, government affairs, and working with our first customer on a number of, um, of issues. Uh, really what it comes down to is in a, you know, we're not quite a startup company, but we've got a, a low overhead and really any kind of special project or other work that uh, the CEO, John Hopkins, wishes me to work on, I work on that. So I have a pretty broad portfolio of things that I uh, participate in. Um, so it's not a traditional CSO role, but it's uh, very flexible, which I like, actually. It's very nice. Yeah, that's great. These are uh, one of the opportunities that a smaller company uh, can give you. You are not only having this rigid uh, set of tasks that you are supposed to do, but everybody is pretty much doing what he's the best in, right? Yeah. Exactly. So... Uh, you are actually not studying nuclear. You started in different uh, part of engineering. Um, what was your university major? So I have sort of a tortured path to how I got to where I am. Um, you know, sort of like most folks, you're impacted by your parents. My dad was a you know member of the Audubon Society and a birder, and you know very much on environmental issues. And one of my first experiences or, or exposures was reading Silent Spring by Rachel Carson back in the 70s. Um, and that always had a pretty big impact upon me. And at the same time, late 70s, and particularly in um, Massachusetts, where I grew up, there was a lot of discussion about the uh, Yankee power plants, which were nuclear power plants, the Seabrook nuclear power plant, and even the uh, Plymouth uh, power plant down in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And at that time, there was a large concern about you know, what you did with the, the nuclear waste. And in fact, I wrote a, a paper uh, for our eighth grade project, uh, where basically I came out as anti-nuclear uh, on that paper. Um, you know, so that's sort of where I was back in, you know, when I was in eighth grade, ninth grade. And I went through to graduate from high school and then into MIT and got my electrical engineering degree, uh, bachelor of science and computer science. Uh, worked at General Electric Company for several years. Moved into the business side on their corporate audit staff for three years. I went back and got my master's in business administration from Cal Berkeley uh, back in the early 90s. Um, when I came out of that location, you know, really I'd been making a, a move from sort of the more detailed engineering type space to being uh, sort of a higher level, looking at more of a macro impact with the things that I did. So one of the first opportunities I had out of uh, business school was to work for Bechtel Financing Services associated with the Bechtel construction firm. And I got into, you know, financing and um, development of large infrastructure projects. 
uh, really started off with um, you know looking at coal, at um, copper mines, looking at water projects, looking at uh, some um, waste coal projects, and then eventually moved into developing large fossil fuel projects. Uh, first one was a project in India called the Dabol Project. And I moved on to a project in uh, Australia, which was a coal project. Um, and I came back to the United States, worked on gas projects, and then finally a coal project in West Virginia in 2006 or seven. Um, about that time, you know, I've always believed that power is an important um, factor for people to have a high quality of life. And having affordable power was something that I always saw as being very important to and not only here in the United States, but overseas where I've done some of my projects and, and been engaged. But at that point, it really came into the fore of, okay, you know, is there a way to you know, get the benefits of large infrastructure projects um, for power that could be done in a way that was, you know, I saw as being cleaner. And that's when I first got engaged in nuclear. Uh, at that time, the Energy Policy Act of 2005 had passed a couple of years earlier. And there were incentives put in place to get new nuclear projects and what they call the renaissance uh, to move forward. And I went on to join the uh, company called Unistar, which was a joint venture between EDF, Electricity de France, and um, Constellation Energy. They were pursuing a large uh, light water reactor. It was the, um, the EPR, the Evolutionary Pressurized Reactor, which is being deployed in um, France and um, Finland, and it's also being deployed and actually operating now in uh, China. And what I came away mm -hmm. from in that experience was that, you know, the technology was, was very safe, but it was also very active technology. Mm -hmm. And Was it like a typical EPR with four loops and uh, four safety trains, or there was something uh, US, uh, added by US uh, to, to this design? Yeah, it had the four safety trains. It had large diesel generators on it. it required, you know, active pumping in order to keep it cooled down. Um, and you know, in 2011, we had Fukushima occur. And you know, what became clear was, you know, two things. One is that active was a challenge because if you lost power to many of these designs, you ran into a problem. The second thing was just the sheer size of these plants at, you know, 1,600 megawatts, somewhere between. 10 to 15 billion dollars we were talking about it's just too much money for people to afford and the number of grids where you could actually connect these into was was limited right once you get outside of the developed mm -hmm. world if you have a grid that's only 5,000 megawatts you really can't put that large of a unit onto a small grid and if your goal is to really you know advance human development and provide people without power the access to power we had to do it in smaller increments so at that time, I had the opportunity to come over to New Scale and, and you know, started going to the small reactors, uh, which I saw as being able to do uh, a couple of things. One is the New Scale reactor was totally passive, uh, which was very, you know, keen. The other thing was that it was mostly manufactured in the factory. So moving that high consequence, high cost activities from a field environment to a factory environment. Um, and I saw it as being affordable, meaning that you know, say $3 billion, I've done coal plants that have costed $2.2 .2 billion. So if you do a coal plant, you can do one of the new scale plants. So for a lot of reasons, I was very excited to come over to new scale and, and um, you know, take a shot at trying to make it work in this space. And I looked at the renewables, I looked at other uh, areas, but again, I saw it really one of scale and being able to scale at the, at the amount needed to really have an impact is how I felt we needed to go with nuclear. The big new reactor units were just too much scale. And we're hoping that maybe we found something that's just right with the new scale reactor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still at Unistar, uh, you were working in the US, uh, but in a French company, actually, the Unistar was owned by EDF. Um, how do you compare the two working cultures? Were you able to observe uh, any differences and which one uh, would you, uh, did you like more? So it was definitely different working uh, with the French company. I mean, it was a 50-50 joint venture. So they were, they were sort of equal. But in that arrangement, mm -hmm. EDF was bringing the cash and, and into the adventure. And Constellation was providing the platform with the existing sites on it. 
Um, so it was very interesting. You know, so for example, um, when we formed the joint venture uh, or formed the company, you know, all of a sudden we would have, uh, you know, several hundred French expats coming into the country to work onto the project. And so bringing all those folks in, getting them assimilated, working in their context was one challenge. Um, the other was that certainly the cultures are different. And we had to do a lot of cultural training and um, work on it. And the third was, you know, what I found out was, you know, sometimes you can be deceived by people who speak English pretty well without an accent. But when you find out is that, you know, and sometimes my vocabulary might be 20,000 words that French person may be able to speak without an accent, but their vocabulary may be 5,000 words in English. And so that translation, it goes from them picking out a, word, a concept in French, going to English, me hearing it in English and going back into French was more of a challenge than you really would have thought. And I found it to be more problematic with the people that the, the the less accent they had, sometimes the more communication issues we had because there was an assumption that they were working from the same base. Now, I mean, that's fortunate for me because I don't know how to speak or I should know how to speak some French, but I don't. And so it put the onus on those folks. But to me, that was one of the things I found just in a communication style, um, very different. Um, and plus they had a, a history in, in the French company of EDF of, you know, sort of having people do a two-year assignment and then rotating out. And you see that in EDF because it's a big company with tens of thousands of employees. That's not what you see typically in the U.S. nuclear reactor fleet where people get into a position. There's not like a, a big plan of who's going to fill in behind you and you move to the next position. So that was uh, an interesting part of it. And then finally, sort of the interaction between the French... Um, you know, private sector and the French government was a lot tighter and a lot more coordinated than you would see in the United States. And again, that had pluses and minuses. Um, you know, how, how EDF would expect a problem to be handled in France if you had to do something. Uh, it was more of a collegial working together relationship with government. In the United States, you know, we're working hard to have public-private partnerships but there's a reason why we have the system we have. And, you know, you can be, try to work together, but there's always that separation that exists between the public sector and the private sector. It's not as clear or it's less distinct in the, in the French culture. So those are all things that I learned and, and really, you know, learned a lot from that, that experience. Um, you know, and, and I thought there were lots of pluses and lots of minuses and on whole, uh, I would have liked to have that been successful. But again, I think, you know, a number of things happened where, again, fundamentally, the design was just too large for the U.S. marketplace. So it was not affordable. Mm -hmm. And then we had the other issue of just the economics going down. And then you had cheap natural gas and you had the re renewables coming in. So all those things conspired to make it a real, a real challenge for the large reactors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you think about big units uh, and their future in, in nuclear energy? Um, was CPR any special in not winning the market in US or it's just it's not the capacity that will be the, the, the future uh, success? Of uh, I think there's a, a, a place for the large reactors for sure. Um, you know, I kind of look at it as that the small reactors have the ability to fit into places where because of the amount of capital that people can put on their balance sheet or because of the size of the grid, we're really, in essence, expanding the market. So, you know, there's going to be places and you see it still today where company countries in, in Central Europe and Europe are saying we want a large reactor for this particular need. And if we're looking at district heating or some other aspects, we want maybe a smaller reactor. Or if it's a smaller grid, they can say, you know, at this point in time, we can't put a large reactor on the grid. So that might be like a Jordan or uh, other countries where, you know, it's not just the EPR. The VVR was what the Jordanians were looking at originally. And it was just, you know, they got a good price on the, on the Russian reactor. But in terms of how much transmission they had to build out in order to accommodate it, it ended up being very expensive. 
So, you know, I think there's a place for both. I think that we've really been able to expand the market and the opportunity for nuclear with those small reactors. When you moved to new scale, what were the qualities, what were the experience that uni Star didn't prepare you for? Um, you know, so the, the biggest thing I found about moving to nuclear is I really um, appreciated the safety culture. And, you know, in, in the sense of, you know, everybody has heard there's a place for an opinion and it's not um, one where it's a uh, top down in the sense that if you have merit to an idea or a concern, it's, it's listened to respectfully. And, you know, when I came out of the private, um, out of the um, independent power project development, you know, that was a totally commercially driven um, aspect and economically driven uh, aspect to it. Not to say that you can't, you don't have that in nuclear, but clearly the concern over safety and the culture you operate in to discuss ideas generally, I thought was uh, more conducive to having you know real dialogues and discussions and being able to talk out the merits of it. So I found that to be a very uh, refreshing kind of environment from that standpoint. And, um, you know, at some point, um, you know, I was the, the senior vice president of project development. You know, people could ask a question of you. And, you know, in the old regime, it would be they would not ask a question of you if I was over in the fossil plant development. But nuclear, they could. And, and I enjoyed that. Um, you know, basically, I grew up with three older brothers. And, you know, I learned to be pretty, pretty forceful in how I present and what I do. Um, it's good to have people feeling that same way to come back at me when I'm working in the nuclear sector. It's great. Uh, when I look at NewScale, uh, every time I open news, pretty much uh, each time World Nuclear News uh, is opened in my engine, I see some new partnerships, some new memorandum uh, of understanding uh, opened by NewScale. Uh, probably when you start such cooperations, uh, you really need to prepare to enter new market, to also enter um, new working culture. Um, it, th does it take a lot of time and does it take a lot of effort to uh, to enter such new place, newcomer country? Um, so it's a broad experience, right? So the, the countries and the, and the memorandums of understanding and things you've seen could be in countries like in the UK or Canada, they could be in Czech Republic, could be in, um, you know, uh, Jordan, could be in other uh, developing countries. So depending upon where they are in their spectrum of adopting nuclear kind of dictates, you know, technologically where they are and regulatorily where they are. Um, and then there's just the, the cultural aspects of it um, as well. And so, you know, my position, um, I've had a lot of exposure to the things we're doing overseas with folks, but more in the context of how we have the U.S. government interface with their home government, because nuclear is one of those things where, you know, the governments are involved and depending upon whether you have a state-owned enterprise overseas or private sector, making those connections is sort of what, where I focus on. Um, so that's been kind of a, a, a real challenge for us in terms of making sure that not only do we have the public-private partnership in the United States, but how does that translate over to what we're doing over overseas? And, you know, the one thing I tell people all the time, and I say, you know, look, in, in the United States, our natural reaction is to be wary of government, right? I mean, that's just <laughs> the way the United States business people are. Whereas overseas, it's like, like I said, the French culture is that the, the, the government and the businesses, I mean, they have people going between those all the time. I mean, they went to the hot, you know, the HECs or wherever they went to. They move in and out of, you know, private corporations that are, you know, might have French ownership in them. Um, and so you find that in other places as well. So it's a more back and forth and more of a collegial atmosphere um, for that. And there's an expectation with our overseas partners is that, you know, the government needs to be there with you. The U.S. government has to be there with, with new scale. So that gets to the next question, right? In our system the government is not supposed to pick winners and losers. And so when a foreign company comes over and says, okay, 
New Scale, I hear what you're saying about this, but how come the Department of Energy hasn't said that you're the chosen one? And to explain to people that that's not how it works in the United States, they cannot choose a winner. You get to choose between New Scale, Holtec, GE, Westinghouse, and the U.S. government is going to support all of its U.S. companies. And they sit over there and they go like, that's not <laughs> yeah, what we have where we are. You need to adapt to their style, no? You need to adapt to their style of uh, picking the, the companies, right? So you need to convince them with uh, what you have, with all the range of services that you can provide. You have to convince them and you also have to get over the thing of, you know, hey, just because the U.S. government didn't pick me doesn't mean it's because they don't like me. It's because they can mm -hmm. pick a winner or a loser. That's just the way our system works. And, you know, it's not, you know, the Chinese are another example, right? They have a number of state owns and they just say CNNC is going to be operating here. CGN will operate here. You know, SPIC will operate in this area. That's not how it works in the United States. Russia, mm -hmm. Rosatom, they've got the whole world for Russia. United States, you have GE, you have Westinghouse, you have New Scale, you have Holtec, you have X Energy. I mean, we have just a lot of mm -hmm. companies um, engaged in this, and that's mm -hmm. part of the mix. I and mean, that's part of the reason why we innovate and are so creative. Mm -hmm. But I do see it as being a challenge for people when they sit there and say, you know, do I have to pick? Can't the US government just pick one of you guys for me? And it's that's not what they do. <laughs> uh, but then you come to some neutral ground, uh, a country that is open to uh, whoever is going to offer a good service. Uh, and then you need to still uh, compete with uh, state owned companies. Like you come to Jordan. It's a very good example, I think, because uh, in in this country, there is uh, Ross Atom. There's also, I think, Rolls Royce uh, starting some partnership. Uh, and there is you. How? Uh, wh what are you uh, planning to offer to such a country when competing with uh, Ross Atom? Yeah. So you know, interestingly, I don't think that Ross Atom is now in there, right? So they started off originally in Jordan with uh, VVR one thousands or eleven hundreds, and mm -hmm. as I said, they found out that while well, the, the the price and the cost for those reactors was attractive to them, and Russia would finance it. The amount of investment they'd have to put into the transmission grid to accommodate those large units was prohibitive. And so they went out and they said, we're going to look at SMRs. And so now, as I understand it, with the SMRs, there's probably um, down to three. And it's uh, two U.S. companies and a Chinese company. And what they're looking at is a combination of, you know, what is the safety case for it? So when you look at a, a U.S. technology, Typically, we're going to have, you know, these two features that most others won't have. One is will be entirely passive safe, meaning that in the case of new scale, we can shut down and permanently cool for an indefinite period of time without any operator action, without any outside power, without any additional water. And that's true for a number of U.S. companies. The other thing we have is because of our safety case and because of the size and because of what we've done with source term, um, we have an emergency planning zone that we demonstrate is at the site boundary. So going from 10 miles to the site boundary, having a totally passive safety system, those are two things that the United States really excels in. So that mm -hmm. part of it is hugely important to people. And then the final part of it is that once you get an NRC review of what we've done and you get us operating in the United States, it's a very high hurdle for people uh, as they're coming into the nuclear business. And they see that and they say, you know, my people, my country is going to be safe because I'm pretty confident that the NRC in the United States, any U.S. company is going to have the highest levels of safety. Um, it's borne out by the years of operating experience we've had and, and uh, behavior on it. So we compete on all those pieces there. What we don't compete on is obviously if you have a state-owned enterprise that can just say, I'll price it at whatever. Right. You know, they don't really care. Or I'll give you 50 percent of loan or I will uh, extend your payments to a very long period, mm -hmm. which you maybe are not interested in. It's all people working in China or it's all people working in Russia. 
And, you know, whether they make a profit or not in this particular thing isn't so important. So they can certainly undercut in cost. The other thing they can do is because, you know, a lot of the plants, you know, even ours or even the Russians, a lot of it is local content, right? So they can finance that and provide the money for the local country to be able to afford it. So what the United States really needs to do, and this is the piece that I'm really excited about with the recent um, fuel working group report that the uh, Department of Energy highlighted, is having U.S. sources of financing. Not that we're going to be the cheapest source of financing, but we have a source of financing for those mm -hmm. countries, and it's affordable. Uh, in the form of loan or... So it could be in the form of loans and the U.S. government is now getting the uh, potential to do it with equity as well. Um, but again, the key thing is, is, you know, to be affordable so that people have an option to finance it. Now, if it ever comes mm -hmm. down to where people are just strictly focused on, you know, how many cents per kilowatt hour it is, then chances are the Chinese and the Russians will be able to go in there and compete and win on just that basis. But where people are most concerned about the safety part of it and the operating history and the fact that they're not going to be beholden to a, you know, what I call a payday loan um, type financier where, you know, really they end up giving loans, knowing that the country will default and then going in and seizing the assets. That's not what the United States does. That's not our goal. We're, we're there to make sure it's affordable, that they can they can bear the cost of it. And it's a good option for them. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit different um, mentality and it's a different axis of, of competition that we're talking about uh, with those folks. In the United States, it's all about, you know, how many dollars and cents it is per kilowatt hour, right? I mean, but that's because you're working in a single environment where you have the NRC, the U.S. government, all those rules and strictures in place. When you go into a country where they don't have, a, you know, a billion dollar organization like the NRC, right? The NRC budget is a billion dollars a year. Hmm. They don't have that in places like Jordan or Ghana or Kenya. Yes, I am interested in it. Uh, are there any international incentive, uh, incentives of bridging uh, the SMR market? young companies in the end with this young economies and uh, only entering in nuclear sector, only building their regulatory bodies and not having much experience in it. So um, there, there is increasingly with the United States where they're focused now on um, looking at the sort of phases of adopting a nuclear industry. And so, for example, the International Atomic Energy Agency has their 19 steps. They say, here are the things you need to do become part of that. Mm -hmm. there's, that goes the whole range of things, right? But one of them is establishing the capacity, both a regulator and the regulatory framework. And, you know, the NRC currently has, I think, about 43 memorandums of understanding to do cooperate with foreign uh, regulators. And we really need to expand upon that to get in there and provide that U.S. Um, expertise you know, not looking to displace anybody, just saying that it is now an option. In the past, it really hasn't been an option that we focused on. But when you talk to a lot of people overseas, and even countries where they have their own large state-owned enterprises, when we talk to the safety regulators there, they always ask, they've asked me personally, how does the NRC look at this? How does the NRC deal with that? Can you tell us how the NRC evaluated an emergency planning zone at the site boundary? Can you tell me how they looked at you know, the need for power and whether or not you need to have an external connection to the grid. All that stuff, you know, is, you know, it's, it's detailed, it's um, a lot of effort, it's a lot of engineering. Um, but when you have a regulator such as the NRC doing that, you have companies in the U.S. who are familiar with doing that, it's something we kind of lose sight of, the fact that we have that. But I think that the United States government has realized that before you can have a sale of a U.S. reactor in some of these countries, you need to have a regulator on it. And so there are initiatives that the U.S. government aren't taking to make sure that there is uh, you know, really foundational infrastructure in those countries for the responsible use of SMR technology. And they'll start that off with a few countries, and then if it's successful, they'll branch it out to more countries. But, you know, they do recognize the challenge, and, and they are 
really taking a look at how do they uh, make sure that the, the playing field, I wouldn't say is completely even, but at least, you know, we have an opportunity to compete, not on any one axis, but on a number of different things. So overall, providing, you know, what should be a pretty compelling uh, deliverable to foreign customers who are coming into nuclear. Mm -hmm. And what are your uh, favorite uh, economical advantages of uh, New Scale? What makes it uh, economical and uh, better than, than other competitors? So when we went to our design, you know, it, it comes down to how much stuff do you have? And so when we went from a, to our design for a small modular reactor, you know, what you see in some of the state-owned enterprises do overseas is take a large reactor and just shrink it down. Mm -hmm. That has a diseconomy of scale, right? Because, you know, you get larger, you have, you know, more output per unit of mass or volume or whatever metric you want to use. New scale, we've basically, we've gone smaller, we've eliminated about two thirds of the systems and components that you find in a large light water reactor. So we don't have reactor coolant pumps. And if you don't need, you know, power for the safe shutdown, we don't need emergency diesel generators. We don't need to have all these other mm -hmm. backup systems. And, you know, whenever you do something in, in nuclear, if it's for safety, you need two of them. You know, so everybody looks at us and the first thing they say is like, you know, hey, new scale, you know, you have 12 modules there. You have 12 of everything. And I'm like, I don't have any reactor pumps. So as far as I know, 12 times <laughs> zero is still zero. They said, well, but you have 12 pipes. And I said, well, you know, I have 12... 13 inch pipes as opposed to one big 48 inch pipe. That's a lot easier stuff to manage and to build and to do on the field um, than it is. You know, um, my containment, it's done in a factory. It's not built with a steel reinforced concrete structure that is, you know, complicated and safety significant in the field. I'm doing it in a factory. So all those things kind of come down to really providing some economies of simple. And if you just think about it, right, if I have two thirds less stuff, that means I have two thirds less stuff to buy, to maintain, that can break, that can cause us to learn how to do. Yeah, exactly. So all those things really help it out. Um, the other thing we have is that because of our modular design, we've gone to, you know, we can refuel our modules one at a time. A 12 reactor. So our model is a, mm -hmm. each module is 60 megawatts of electric. You can have up to 12 in the plant. Each one of those modules has its own uh, power production plant, so its own steam turbine generator. So if you take one out, you only lose 60 megawatts off of the grid. Mm -hmm. And then we have the facilities inside of the reactor building to disassemble and refuel it using the staff on hand. Right now, they're going through with COVID-19 here in the United States. You know, you have to bring in a thousand people from off-site to do a refueling. You know, you have to train them, you have to screen them, you have to house them, you have to feed them, you have to do everything else with those folks. And so it's a big impact upon the local workforce, economy. Um, and planning-wise, you know, that plant will be down for however long it takes for that workforce to be trained to be, be in there. We've gotten very good at it in the United States. But if you can think about just having a dedicated workforce who, you know, in our case, on average, every two months, we'll be taking one of our modules out for refueling. They're going to get very good at it. And it's going to be very quick. Mm -hmm. and It's going to be very efficient. Um, and as a result, we have a very high capacity factor expected for our plant, you know, 95% or so. And again, mm -hmm. it just comes down to you know, we went through and we looked at what the causes of scrams were in the U.S. reactor fleet over several years. And about two thirds of them were due to things that we don't have in our system. The emergency diesel generator is, you know, going to leak. Well, we don't have that problem, you know, or you have, you know, the reactor coolant pump, you know, is out of spec. We don't have a reactor coolant pump or you, so all those things that we got rid of are no longer a cause for you having to bring the plant down and, and take it out of service. We just don't have them. So that's a huge benefit for us as well um, on it. And it shows up in a number of ways. It shows up in the cost of the plant, it shows up in the, uh, the operators to maintain it. 
it shows up in what we'd expect in terms of core damage frequencies, um, you know, you know, once every three billion years or so. So, I mean, that's just, that's at a point where it's not really meaningful, but I mean, it's a number you, you calculate. And because of that, you know, we really do see an ability to be very cost effective and, and economic. That said, if you have a state owned enterprise that doesn't need to make money, you know, then, you know, it's always going to be a question of how are you economic against that. But in the United States, we feel, or any place where they properly allocate the cost to something and say, here's what it actually costs, we feel very comfortable with where we are competitive wise. That's great. Uh, out of curiosity, uh, do you know what is the learning curve of uh, the factory made new scale? Uh, after uh, which time or how many units uh, are you able to reach the you know top of optimization? So um, you know what our what our plan is is that initially we'll be using existing manufacturing capacity to build our modules, and you know what we've been talking to manufacturers they figure by the time we get to the eighth module right so that's two thirds through the that's less than a less than one plant exactly less than one that's plant great. they'll have gotten that part of it so they'll feel that they'll have reached out and gotten most of that worked out in that plant which wasn't specifically built for new scale production. Then there'll be a second step of productivity where you have a purpose-built plant to build new scale power modules. Mm -hmm. And that will be another step up, I think, in productivity that we'll, we'll catch, you know, not initially because we're going to use existing manufacturing capability, but once you have a dedicated facility, that should also be another step up in productivity that will get another bump up, um, I don't know if learning curve is the right word for that one, but that's really just in terms of production efficiency by having a plant uh -huh. that, you know, you sit there and you say like, gee, if I had this different, um, you know, drilling machine, this would be a better one to use than the one I have in the factory that's existing, mm -hmm. or here's a better layout for the factory. So those kinds of things you can learn in the existing facilities and then implement that into a purpose built facility. So, mm -hmm. uh, we see that being very strong. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think that's going to be, you know, I, I, you think about it, you say like, you know, gee, you know, eight, but when I was at um, Constellation and we were looking at, uh, at Unistar, sorry, we we're looking at EPRs, we always figured that if we could get four EPRs, we could get down to having, you know, all the learning taken care of by the fourth one. And that was informed by experience that people had in the United States where, you know, um, I think it was Byron and Braidwood were two identical two unit plants uh, owned by Commonwealth Edison at the time. And it was the same thing. They said, they, you know, the first one took way longer, cost a lot more. The fourth mm -hmm. one, I mean, it went like you wouldn't believe because the learning we had from the workforce and being on the fourth one. So it doesn't take a lot to get those real economies uh, down in nuclear. And, and it's substantive. So we're pretty... You know, we have a lot of experience to point to in terms of manufacturers who do this stuff, um, you know, all the time. And uh, we expect that we'll see those those productivities. Mm -hmm. Do you already have some ideas which uh, what kind of factory to use for this first stage when you don't have a dedicated factory yet? So we have design partners and we have people who've identified as manufacturing partners. Um, so the, the first one is uh, BWX Technologies, this is the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. Manufacturer, um, sir, you know, supplies reactors in the nuclear navy. They did commercial nuclear reactors previously, so they're one partner um, that we're dealing with. And then we have also as a shareholder, Doosan Heavy Industries. So you know they do right. um, reactor components as well. So they are a second um, source or potential partner we have for the supply of these things. And you know we came to those two choices having done a worldwide search for you know, who our partner should be. And what you find out is because our modules are smaller, there's a lot more places that have the capability to build our modules. So when you look at the ability to rapidly scale, it's not just you have one facility where that's the only place that can do it. There are literally you know, probably a half dozen, dozen facilities that can make significant portions of our module globally so that once we get that first module operating in the United States, we can then begin to deploy 
and build out from a number of existing manufacturing facilities if we partner with them. And we are talking to folks about that. And while we're doing that, build the U.S. facility to be able to build, you know, 36 or 48 modules per year. Because you know, that will take some time. But you need, you know, so I'm pretty encouraged by the fact that, you know, we're not stuck with just one option. We have a number of places where we can we can build these. Hmm. Uh, changing your topic a little bit. Um, many people are uh, have this opinion that uh, the SMRs that are based on light water are only the transition technology uh, to give the time to generation for generation form to the uh, for to develop and uh, finally for the generation four reactor to take over the market. Uh, what do you think about this? Uh, is it true? Is it uh, not the case? Uh, you know I. I don't know what's true. I mean, you know, we had wood burning for centuries, right? So that was a transition fuel. Then we had coal. That was a transition fuel for a century. Then you had oil, which has been going on a century. Uh, natural gas will be going on for half a century. Um, you know, so our particular technology, will it be, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Uh, you know, if we don't need to be around for 100 years to be successful at what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're a transition, we feel pretty comfortable with the transition, you know, that, that we look out to maybe 2040. And at that point, you know, we could be wildly successful as new scale, um, have a huge beneficial impact to society of providing, you know, clean carbon free power. And, you know, if there's another transition to a Gen 4 or whatever they want to call it technology, um, you know, we'll have done very well on that part. And those resources will stay in operation for, you know, 50, 60 years. So it's not like they're just going to go away at that point in time. So there's a longevity to these things, uh, which I think will always hold sway. And, you know, really, you get down to it. You know, once you get down to a point where if you're paying, you know, for energy, five or six cents a kilowatt hour or four cents a kilowatt hour, that's pretty darn cheap when you look at the rest of the world and what they're doing. Now, in the United States, it's three cents, right? But that's not the rest of the world. So you, you really look at it and you say, you know, at some point there's affordable and it almost becomes like you don't really notice what your electricity bill is in a way because it's pretty affordable for most people. Over in other parts of the developing world, I mean, they're paying huge prices for electricity because it's very intermittent or they're importing diesel or they're importing, you know, other, other resources. So, you know, bringing that cost down, I think is the first thing, but if we can get all folks to the level where the United States is in terms of cost, then I think that the, you know, people will be pretty happy with that outcome and people will be pretty well served. So I, I have a lot of, you know, I, I think it's looking pretty good. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, as for long-term uh, plans of new scale, are you um, thinking of becoming the designer of reactors? Is there any new scale tool coming in some decades, or you're thinking of maybe rather providing the services for the fleet that is that will be in place? Yeah, so you know we've tried to stay focused on our, our core technology. I mean, so we're going to get a design certification in September of this year. Knock on wood. Um, and then we'll be in a position, <laughs> fingers crossed, toes crossed, everything crossed. And, you know, then we'll be in a position, uh, to get our first customer across the line. Now that said, I mean, about 40% of our workforce is under the age of 40 and they've come to new scale because they believe in nuclear and they believe in all sorts of different nuclear. So there's a huge interest in seeing, you know, what is new scale too? Is it a derivative thing from what we're doing currently? smaller reactor or different, you know, whatever, or is it a different cooling technology? So, you know, we, we kind of look at those things on the side, but really our focus is making sure that we deliver, you know, our first module on time, on budget and with quality and a product that, you know, customers will say, you know, we want this because, you know, really, New Scale has been fortunate in that we've been in a position to kind of disprove all the things that people normally assumed about nuclear. 
you know, a new company could not get the financing to put together a quality design certification on time. We did. The NRC will never review it according to a schedule. They are. Next thing will be is like, you know, it always comes in over budget and behind schedule. Well, we're working very hard with the Department of Energy, our partner uh, on this, and our first customer, Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems, to make sure every lesson learned that there is, you know, is that we actually learn it and we incorporate it into our plan. So, you know, if one of the lessons learned was there wasn't enough design complete before they went to a field, went to the field, we will have a high degree of design complete before we go into the field. If there is a aspect of our technology, which it's all light water reactor technology, but it's a little bit different. So for example, we have control rod drives, the same exact control rod drives we're using in the rest of the fleet. We have control, long control rods. So we're testing and building those things. We have a helical coil steam generator. Same tubes they use in a U-tube generator, but coiled. We're building those. So any place where we see, you know, identified either ourselves or our customers or our technical advisory board, that they've identified a risk, we have a plan in place to make sure we mitigate and really expire that risk before we go into the field. So it's it's a... You know, we've spent $950 million so far. Uh, we probably have another four or 500 million to go. And that's because we're gonna make sure, you know, we don't squeeze down up front because we wanna make sure that we make the investment that's necessary, not only for the safest design, but for a commercially viable design. And that means all the things that are outside the nuclear safety island, or the nuclear island, they need to be designed as well. And we're gonna do that. What are the near-term uh, goals of uh, New Scale that uh, you are going to show the world that this is also possible to be done, and this is also possible to be done, and that is also possible to be done? Yes, no, exactly. That's that's what we're doing, and um, you know, I think the the next thing clearly for us is a design certification, um, and then that will quickly be followed up by you know our first customer moving forward and supplying submitting a. Um, <clears throat> their combined license application. Um, and then the background of that, we'll be doing manufacturing trials and tests with our selected supply partners so that you know we know that we'll have the modules available when they need to be installed uh, by that time. So all those things are coming together. It's a, it's a large undertaking, um, but we're moving through it. And it just requires uh, you know, a certain attention to detail, requires having a plan, and it requires you to acknowledge that, you know, it, if you're going to do anything right the first time or have the highest opportunity for success, you need to invest a lot of time and effort in it. And, you know, I look at, um, it was the other thing, I was always amazed by the, the U.S. nuclear fleet, right? They went from having outages that would take, you know, three, four, five months sometimes for refueling. And they've gotten it down now to, you know, anywhere from four to six weeks. And one of those outages, you know, they're going to bring on 1,600 people, may cost, you know, 50 to $100 million. And I asked my boss, I said, you know, how is it, you know, what is it you do, you know, to be ready for that? And he goes, the minute we finish one outage, we start planning for the next one two years away. And we get every lesson learned. And I said, okay, so if an outage costs you, you know, how, what percent do you spend before you even start the outage. He's like 20, 25% spent before they start the outage. So having that commitment to spend that kind of money, you know, think about it, right? You start time zero, and by year two, you've spent 20% of the money. And then over the next, you know, month and a half, two months, you're spending the rest of it. That requires a high level of detail and, and dedication to saying we're going to invest in the things we need to have there and ready because a day of schedule is worth more than the dollar that we try to save here. So I, I was always really impressed by their level of, of planning and dedication to making sure that they kept on squeezing down, you know, how long it took for them to do a refueling outage in the U.S. nuclear fleet 
And that shows, you know, and they do it with safety. They do it with quality. I mean, the U.S. operating fleet has the lowest cost per unit produced. They have the uh, highest capacity factor in, in globally in the world. I mean, it's just amazing to look at it. And they have the highest safety. And it was just amazing to me, you know, what my boss would tell me, who was a long-term nuclear guy, he said, you know, look, you know, back in the old days, we had maybe 70% capacity factors. What we found out is that at, after a Three Mile Island, we dedicated ourselves to safety and implementing and then planning and making sure we knew what we were doing. Not only did the safety go up, but our capacity factors went up and our operating costs came down. So all those things work together where, you know, I think that there's a good reason why the U.S. nuclear fleet is looked at um, as it is. And that was, quite frankly, one of the reasons why EDF partnered with Constellation to form Unistar, because they saw that operating experience as being, you know, if we could just get that at our plants, how much better would we be? So, you know, uh, I'm pretty proud of not being a nuke myself. I've never operated a nuclear plant, but seeing what these folks have done, it, it, to me, it's pretty amazing. Are you excited about the nearest future of NewScale? No, I, I absolutely am excited about the, the future of NewScale. Um, you know, I, I wish it could happen faster, um, but it's, uh, you know, I tell people, I joke about it. This is the longest I've ever been in one job, one company. <laughs> you need to love it very much. Well, yeah, so, but, um, you know, like most of the, the folks I'm working with, we all want to be here and we like what we're doing and we believe that not only are we going to be successful as new scale, but we see the opportunity to really make a, a contribution to the rest of the world in this. So when you go to, you know, places, I mean, I've traveled a lot and I've had that experience. I mean, there's lots of places where they don't have the energy they need, you know, and they have food that, that spoils out in the field or they have food that spoils, you know, in the market because they don't have refrigeration. They don't. You know, all those things you need power for, just the basic things, um, the rest of the world doesn't have. And, you know, when you look at the ability to help your, your, your fellow man, I believe that that's a, a huge thing that we need to do. And I've always felt that way with energy. That's why I've been very interested in doing large infrastructure energy projects. Um, and I think doing it with nuclear is the, the next, you know, for me, stage of my growth. And I don't know if I have another act after this one. But, you know, this will be a, you know, by far the most challenging um, and probably the most worthwhile thing I've done uh, professionally. Um, so, I, yeah, I'm very excited for the future of New Scale. The New Scale employees um, are as excited, if not more excited than I am. And, uh, and it's always great to go back and, and talk to those mm -hmm. folks because you just see it and what they're doing and you know, for example, like a lot of people impacted by COVID-19, we've gone to teleworking. And we have had no diminution in productivity. So we've been able to telework and people have been um, doing so, you know, admirably. I mean, it's just been phenomenal to me to sit there and say there hasn't been a downturn. And it would have been easy to say that, you know, hey, you know, this happened, you know, I'm preoccupied with this. I have... I mean, we all have kids, we have older parents, we have all these situations which are, you know, things that you need to pay attention to. But new scale employees have demonstrated that, you know, not even even during this hard time where you're teleworking and they have all the same concerns as the rest of Americans, that they're able to continue to, to, to move forward. And so, you know, I think it's a tribute to those folks. I mean, it's to me, it's really amazing. Greetings to all the new scale employees and uh, I wish you the best in the, your upcoming goals. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> and initiate at least a new approach to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversation. If the world is to take off the inertia imposed by fear and is to make positive progress for peace.